Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here and awake so early in the morning. Uh, I want to give you a little uh, rundown of uh, what we're seeing in terms of uh, how companies approach the problems of, of machine learning. And you know, you all know the standard model. You get some uh, data, some pictures, and you put some labels on it, and then you throw in some of that TensorFlow stuff, and then uh, profit. <laughs> Right, and how does that happen? Well, it's not always quite that direct. It's uh, sometimes a little bit more complicated. Why is that? Uh, well, there's some surprises along the way. So the first thing is, uh, we've been going out, and we've been talking to uh, companies like you and, and others, and saying, what do you expect the difficulties are gonna be? Uh, you know, here's all the parts you have to do, you have to, define your objectives, collect the data, build the infrastructure, optimize the ML algorithm, and then integrate it into your product. And people's expectation is, well, the hard part's gonna be that algorithm stuff, all that math, that's gonna be really hard, right? And then they go out and actually do it, and it's really more, the reality is more like this, that the math part was the easy part, and the hard part is getting the data, building the infrastructure to and then doing the integration of, uh, you know, fitting together the machine learning part with the rest of your product. And the math part's just a tiny little bit. Uh, so it really flips uh, the, the work you have to do from what you expected you have to do. So what we're, we're trying to put together is a methodology that matches this reality rather than matches the expectation. Here's some of the pitfalls we see over and over again. Uh, so one, everybody says, well, machine learning, things will go faster, better, cheaper, it'll all be good, right? And sometimes it really is. And sometimes you do things hundreds of times faster than you could have otherwise. Sometimes you do things that you just couldn't have done at all without machine learning. But other times it ends up being longer because you're doing something new in a methodology you didn't know about and it's always hard to do something the first time. Uh, there's issues of do you have the right data and have you curated it properly and so on. Sometimes people forget that. Uh, this idea that it's all or nothing, that you're either doing machine learning or you're doing manual, uh, that's probably not the, the right way to look at it. The way you should be looking at it is, is what's appropriate for what sub-problem. And don't be afraid to say uh, it's not 100% automated, that there's still some humans in the loop at the appropriate point. Uh, figuring out what the right product is, right? So it's tempting to say, here's a metric that I can optimize up to 99%, but it doesn't help me build my product. That's not what you want to optimize. Um, and then uh, the, the questions of what you're gonna do uh, in-house, what tools you're gonna use, and what level you're gonna use that at. And there's a lot of choices here. You can build everything by yourself. You can take these pre-trained models that various companies are offering, and figuring out that right mix has is, is been another stumbling point. Now, I wanna just step back a little bit and uh, look at the difference between traditional software and machine learning software, right? So in traditional software, we start off and we got a, an engineer or a team of engineers uh, sitting at their desk, and they get an idea and then they manually code all the decision points of every possible thing we have to describe to the computer what to do. And the difficulty is that there's a lot of different paths and you have to make sure everyone works. And that makes uh, traditional software uh, mathematical science. We're basically trying to prove our programs correct. Of course, in the real life, we only do that for little toy programs. We don't actually prove our real programs, but we're aiming in that direction. And we use Boolean logic, and we strive for certainty. And machine learning is quite different. So first of all, it's not the programmer who's writing the program, it's the computer that's writing the program. There's still a place for the human, and that's to be a teacher, to load in the data and teach the system how to learn. And that makes machine learning, uh, uh, makes software an empirical science. So it's more like doing biology than like doing math. 
you, get, you make theories about the world, you test your theories, they're never going to be quite precise, uh, they're not logical and Boolean, they're probabilistic, and you embrace the uncertainty rather than trying to eliminate it. So it's a completely different mindset, and it can be hard for people to get used to that change. Now, we've also, uh, in, a, in addition to the way you look at the problem, we've also uh, made progress in the methodology for how we, we build products. So we started off, software was kind of a studio or a, an artisan field, and here's two guys named Steve in a garage building a great company by themselves. And of course, they had a lot of help later on, but you started out, you had very small teams, there wasn't much methodology, they did it all by the seat of the pants. But then we realized you can only get so far with those small teams, and so we invented sort of the factory model or the assembly line model, where we said, how are we gonna make teams of thousands of software engineers work together? Uh, well, to do that, we need to impose a lot of uh, dis discipline and methodology. And we built that up over basically a, a half century. But now we're saying maybe we don't need that factory model, and maybe it's more like a school model, where now we're gonna have teachers teaching the, the uh, computers what to do. And we're gonna need a new methodology for doing that. So what are the tools we have along the way? So I'm old enough that when I started programming, I actually had one of these, and you, dr you drew out with a pencil little flow charts. Uh, I never thought that was useful, but uh, you, know, you had to do it if you wanted to get an A on your homework, so I said, okay. Uh, but then over time, we built up a much stronger set of tools, and now we have all this great stuff, and we have educational materials and methodologies, and uh, programmers can be more productive because we have this uh, half century of building up a methodology. Now, in machine learning, we're just getting started. So we're more at this level of tools, right? We have these uh, ancient tools, and yeah, they're gonna get more sophisticated over time, and you can see the beginnings of, uh, there's a hammer there and a saw and so on, and, they're and you know they're gonna get better, but we're really just right at the beginning. And yeah, we do have some, r some cool tools that do help. Here's uh, TensorBoard. Uh, but we, ha we haven't built up the whole ecosystem the way we have for traditional software. So. How are we going to get there? How are we going to have a methodology for machine learning success? Well, that's one of the things we're working on. I want to point you to uh, this blog we've been working on called The, the Lever, which, which helps move, move things faster. Uh, and go through uh, a couple of the, uh, the blogs we have. And you know, we, we don't have to read all these words right now, but, it, but it'll be available and, and you can go and look at it. Uh, so one is this idea of experimentation, of saying we don't know exactly where we're going, but we shouldn't, shouldn't worry about that. And we should try to uh, make progress quickly by doing quick experiments, looking at the results, analyzing them, and changing the direction you're going. This idea of how product managers integrate with machine learning I is uh, different. Product managers are, are used to a discipline of saying, this is what we're going to build. Here's how we're going to break it into pieces. I know how long it's going to take to build each of those pieces. I can envision the final product. And with machine learning, it's not always like that, because there's much more variance in how long it's going to take, or whether it's even going to be possible at all to build a, a component. And then where does the data come from? If data is the, the key, sort of data is the uh, new capital, the uh, machinery on the factory floor that makes everything go, uh, where do we get it? What's the uh, process for curating it? Uh, you also think of it as data is, is the new gold. You wanna take good care of that. You're making an investment. You wanna make the right investments and know how to use it properly. Uh, and you can look at those blogs for more on each of those ideas. Uh, again, a lot of words here, you can refer back to it, but uh, we think of the challenge in terms of these five categories. So first, what's the technology? Uh, 
uh, getting used to using all these new tools, uh, using the data, making it flow through, figuring out which models make sense and so on, and, uh, and then deploying that technology. How does having a cool technology fit into a product that makes sense for your customers? Uh, so uh, we've had issues with this where, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot going on at, at Google within the company and a lot of great research going on and a lot of great product development. But if we don't bring those two sides together, we're not going to have success. So I remember as uh, director of research, the photos team came to us and said, uh, we have this terrible uh, success disaster. People are using photos and they're taking lots and lots of pictures and now they're confused and they can't organize them and they can't find their own photos. What can we do? And they said, I think what we need is some human factors resource to make it easier for people to sort all, all their photos into folders. And we said to them, yeah, okay, we've got some of those human factors experts and we think we could probably make that a little bit better. Uh, but how about instead if we automatically labeled all the pictures so nobody had to waste any time putting them into folders? And they said, you can do that? You know, I thought that was science fiction, right? So it was that conversation of the technologist recognizing these guys have a need and the product team recognizing these guys have a technology uh, and you've got to have those conversations. You've got to put those guys together or else we would have wasted all that effort. Uh, the design issues can change, right? So this, that wasn't a great example of where the design was going to change a lot, where we no ha longer had to worry about uh, uh, what's the folder structure look like and what are all the hashtags like. Rather, we could just say, you're going to have a search box, and now we figure out what the results look like when you do that search. So the, the user, user experience is going to be quite different. And then uh, the people problem. Uh, I get a lot of complaints from companies like you of saying, how can we hire these machine learning experts because you and Facebook got them all. Uh, so they're out there. Uh, but the other thing to think about is uh, some of the experts we have are, are not the people you want, right? So you don't need somebody who's going to be uh, writing papers in the top conferences and inventing new algorithms. What you need are people that can take the existing tools and put them together into a product. And sometimes those two types of people are quite different. And somebody who's uh, the world's experts on algorithms might not be the right person to build a product, uh, but somebody who understands that uh, can do it. And then there's a lot of problems uh, around growth that we see companies making the first steps uh, getting some success, and then uh, uh, stumbling a little bit as they try to go forward. Um, and there's a lot of issues around this. So, so part of the problem is when you first get started, you throw in some data and everything works, uh, but then you say, uh, well, now all of a sudden as we grow, we have privacy issues or we have regulatory issues. And these are things you don't think about when you're just kind of developing the algorithm and trying to get something going, but that can be crucial to the success of your company. And so there's another class of people that are important here. Uh, so one of the amazing things to me I learned through Launchpad was talking to a company who said, yeah, for our next hire, I think we'd rather have a lawyer than an engineer. And it was the first time in my career that I actually agreed with that sentiment. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I told you all the issues, and so far it's been kind of negative, it's been tough, uh, but there are cool things you can do. They're just an amazing number of things, and there's more coming. Uh, so I'm going to go through uh, some of them. Uh, I chose some of the, the engagements that we're involved with. I, I didn't chose any of your guys' companies, because that would be like, you know, saying which one of your kids is a favorite. I can't do that, right? So, so left you guys out. Here's uh, a, a team I met at Stanford of uh, astrophysicists, and they're tackling this problem called gravitational lensing. So what does that mean? So there's a galaxy someplace way out there, 
and light is shining from that galaxy to Earth, and in between them and us, there's another galaxy, and that galaxy is heavy, and so that actually bends the light. And if you could measure exactly what was going on, you could essentially that'd be like putting this galaxy in the middle on a scale to see how heavy it is to bend the light, and then you could learn something about dark matter and all that cool stuff that <laughs> these guys care about. And it turns out physicists know how to make that calculation by saying, let's start here. We know apply the rules of physics in the forward direction, and that will tell us if we know what this galaxy is like, that'll tell us what the light looks like. And then if that doesn't match, then tweak this one a little bit and try again. And it takes a long, long time on supercomputers to do that because they have to make lots of trials. And what these guys said is, uh, we're physicists, we understand math, we don't know anything about this machine learning stuff, but we sort of heard that in, in deep learning you can differentiate and go backwards rather than going forwards. And that seems like that's exactly what we need. So in a couple of months, they taught themselves everything they needed to do. They tried it. It worked better than the existing techniques, and it ran 10 million times faster. So that's a pretty cool success. Uh, and you know, they got from zero to success in a couple of months. Now, of course, these are physicists. So you know, a normal person, when you say the word tensor, they get a little bit nervous. Uh, but physicists eat that for breakfast, right? So maybe it's a little bit easier for them. They're, they're literally rocket scientists. Here's another example uh, similar of uh, looking for planets. And, and I used to be at NASA before I was at Google, and I was involved in a precursor to this mission, so I really like it. And the idea is you look at a star far away, and a planet circles that star, and there's an eclipse. So the eclipse blocks out the light a little bit. And the Kepler mission uh, look for that, and all the really, really big planets that pass in front of a distant star and block off a lot of the light, they found all those, and that was cool. Uh, but now we wanted to go back and say, can we find more, smaller planets? Uh, and the existing techniques didn't do that, because there's a lot of uncertainty. It's not just uh, uh, one factor. But the machine learning techniques were able to pick those out, and now we found many more planets than the ones that had already been found. Uh, and I just saw this morning, there was, there was another similar kind of thing with looking at old data where the uh, standard techniques were able to pull out the easy examples, then going back with machine learning and finding more examples. Uh, we've done a lot of work in uh, medicine. Um, this was a problem of looking at the retina and diagnosing eye disease, and we showed we can do that better than regular doctors do. Uh, but then we wanted to say, what else can we do with that? And we said, uh, well, maybe we can detect high blood pressure. It turns out, yeah, we can do that really well. And then the engineers kept going. They were on a roll. And they said, uh, what other columns do we have in the database? Oh, one of the columns is uh, sex. Let's see if we can predict that. And the doctor says, oh, well, hold on a minute. There's no difference between a male and a female retina. You're not going to be able to predict that. And the engineers said, well, if that's so, why did I get 95% accuracy? <laughs> right? And the doctors still don't know why we're able to do that. Their theory of the eye was incomplete. Uh, and met the medical applications go all the way down to high school students, right? So I talked about rocket scientists uh, that have uh, two decades of experience. Here's some kids who don't even have two decades of being alive. Uh, and yet they were able to contribute to this. Uh, it's more than just sick uh, people, so we can also look at sick plants. So you, you go out into the rainforest and uh, detect uh, you know, some browning on the leaves or something, and if you're an experienced farmer, you know what to do, but maybe you're not an experienced farmer, or maybe through climate change you're getting a different sort of disease that you haven't seen before, uh, so we can help with that. And one of the real challenges here was to say, uh, well, we can't put a supercomputer out into the field, uh, and we probably don't have any Wi-Fi connectivity, so it's got to run locally on the phone. And so one of the big challenges is to say, how can we take these compute-heavy applications and scale them down to the size of a phone and make them still work? And, and uh, that we were able to do in this case. Uh, here's another one. And, you know, Every company's got to have uh, an elevator pitch, right? You know, you invent a company and you say, what's your company? And the answer is, uh, 
It's like Tinder, but for cats, right? Uh, so this company called Connectera, it's got an elevator pitch, which is it's like Fitbit, but for cows. Uh, and that seems silly, right? Do cows really need to boast about how many steps they did today? No, they don't. Uh, but the farmer really wants to know what's going on. The farmer wants to know, are any of my cows sick? Are any of them doing anything unusual? Are they, you know, how much water are they drinking? How much are they walking around? Where are they going from here to there? And you put a device with the GPS and, and accelerometer on it, and now you can get the total picture for your full herd. Uh, here's another example uh, uh, where we're out with where there's no uh, Wi-Fi connectivity. So we wanted to detect illegal deforestation. So uh, you know the main thing you can think of, and there's, there's a couple of different things going on, but the main one is, can you hear uh, the sounds of saws cutting down trees? Right. So the power saws they're loud, uh, but there's nobody there. So you put a lot of sensors out into the field. Which the sensors basically you see here. It's a cell phone with some solar cells to keep it powered over time. And then uh, the phones form an, a mesh network with each other, and they're listening, and they uh, alert us to when something's going on. Uh, captioning videos. So on the one hand, we've been doing speech recognition for a long time. This should be easy. But on the other hand, uh, captioning videos is a little bit harder than regular speech recognition. right? So if I'm talking directly into a microphone and it's just one person talking, uh, that's a pretty easy problem. But if there's a video and there's lots of things happening, multiple people talking at once, car crashes and so on, bad microphones and so on, it becomes a lot harder and under different languages. Uh, so we wanted to tackle that and make it all automated and we, ha we had success in that field. Uh, interfacing with the hardware, right? So. Uh, I take a lot of pictures with my phone. I also take a lot of pictures with a big, heavy DSLR. And one of the reasons you want a big, heavy len lens is uh, that allows you to uh, blur out the background. Uh, but we can do that in software as well. And, and here you see examples of being able to do that. So one more example, we worked with the uh, Gina Davis Institute. They're interested in uh, bias in the film industry. And so we uh, built a system that would analyze who's on screen for how long and who has what speaking roles and then say, is that uh, fair across male versus female? And here we see uh, basically the chart is saying in, in movies for which the female is, is the lead, uh, the female appears more often, but not by that much. Whereas in movies where the male is the lead, it's, it's much farther skewed. So we've identified bias here, and you can break that down into components and so on and, and see more. And that was all done automatically, whereas previously they're making very slow progress in hand annotating uh, every frame. We're able to do that all at once. So let me stop here and open it up for questions. Uh, but I just wanted to, g to give you the idea that there is a, a powerful opportunity here. There's so many things you can do. And we have a set of tool set which is continuing to evolve. And you've got to kind of meet that halfway. You've got to be able to say, I want to I adopt this technology and this methodology. And uh, there's going to be some bumps along the way. I'm going to be discovering a lot, some that's new to me, some that's new to everybody. But with that, uh, we can see a lot of opportunities for making success and doing things you couldn't do otherwise. So why don't we open it up uh, for questions now. What is your most overrated and underrated application of machine learning that you see in the field? Kind of? Huh. Um, well, 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 one that might be a candidate for both uh, <laughs> is these uh, assistants, right? So we have this idea that you should be able to talk and have a conversation, and uh, a lot of the emphasis now is on a, a little speaker that you can put on the table that doesn't have a keyboard, doesn't have a screen, but will listen to you. And 
these have proven to be pretty popular and people buy them and say, oh, this is so cool. I can ask it to play music and it plays th the right song and I can ask it for the weather and it tells me the weather and wait a minute, what else can I ask it? <laughs> right? So it was a great success in terms of what it can do, but it's been a failure so far in that we haven't quite figured out everything that you can do. Right? And uh, whereas in other applications, say in, in Google search, we gave the user a pretty good model of what works and what doesn't work. You know, it's basically like you type, you type in some keywords and we'll show you pages that are relevant to those keywords. People understand that model and they know, uh, you know, what the balance of power is. That Google's going to do this amount, but the user also has to bring uh, their savvy to asking the right questions and analyzing the result pages. Uh, with these assistants, we're not quite there yet, right? So we're sort of halfway saying, it's just like a person. You talk to it the way you talk to a person. But we're also saying, well, no, it's not really a person. It doesn't understand everything. Well, what does it understand yet? We, we haven't made that clear yet. And I think over time, uh, well, one, capabilities will expand to be able to do more and more, but we'll also need a better user interface to say, here's how you should think of it in terms of what it can do. You know, are you think of it as, well, it's not a, uh, a grown person, it's an eight-year-old, is that the way to think of it? No, that, that's not quite right, the model, the right model. So we'll, we'll need some way to make that more clear. Thank you. Yeah, so, so are the problems that people try to use machine learning and, and they don't have to? Uh, that's certainly the case, right? And uh, there are some advantages to uh, keeping things as simple as possible, right? So don't employ a heavy duty technology when, a, when an easy one would use. Uh, there's certainly a lot of examples where uh, the benefit is so small that it's easier to do it by hand, even if it's not as automated and you know maybe there's a cost to doing it by hand but still uh, that's easier than investing in a big effort. Uh, there's also kind of the explainability type issue so I know in doing Google search uh, oh, historically we were a little resistant to ha handing too much control to machine learning. So we always had this idea that uh, lots of factors are involved in search and we're going to sort of invent new factors, uh, a thing on the page that you should care about or a way that the user interacts with the page and their history and so on. Uh, that's data. We're going to use that data to improve the product. Uh, and we would often do things like say, uh, well, we're, uh, we figured this out. Now we're going to add this in. How much should we add it in? Well, the machine learning algorithm will figure out the right values of those parameters. Uh, but we were always reluctant to say, let's have the whole thing be, you know, one deep learning network the way we do in machine translation, say. Uh, and I think there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is that we're kind of creating our own tra training data as we go along, right? So there is no uh, natural data out there, right? When you want to do image processing, there are natural pictures out in the world, but there are no natural examples of searches and results other than the ones that we create. Uh, so if we're training on that data and then we change what we're doing, uh, now the data is no longer valid. And the other thing th that concerned us is we felt like we had to think ahead several steps because, uh, you know, in the, in the early days we felt like our job was to observe the web. We were like a library catalog. Somebody else publishes the stuff and, and we just catalog it. Uh, then we realized we're actually interacting with it. Every time we change our algorithm, the webmasters study what we did and try to change what they're doing. So that means we can't just optimize on the current data. We have to say if we make a change, what's going to happen into the future, and, and there is no data on that unknown future. So we felt like we really had to understand what was going on, 
And if everything was just a machine learned model, it was harder for us to predict how the future would change. Whereas if it was handwritten code with a few machine learned parameters, it was easier to do that. So that's one example where we were reluctant. And now over time, as we do more and more machine learning, we gain more confidence in it and uh, more is, is sneaking into the search algorithm. Yeah, so uh, wh what should your relation to data be in general? Uh, and that's a hard question, there's, n there's not one answer. Um, so you have to figure out where can I get the data, how much of it do I need, uh, uh, how, how does it have to be curated or manipulated and so on, and there are multiple paths to that. Right? So sometimes the data is already out there, uh, and you can just go find it and, and collect it. And uh, sometimes you can get it from somebody else. Sometimes you have to create it, right? And there's lots of examples where you create an initial product to get some interaction with the users, and then you kind of bootstrap on that, right? So we did that, for example, in our speech recognition. We wanted to have lots of examples of people talking and getting results. So what we did is we offered a uh, free service, which was directory assistance for telephone numbers, and people would call up and say, <laughs> business, uh, and then we'd give an answer, and then we could say, we could figure out whether we got the right answer or not, because uh, did they then connect to the business? Uh, so we invested uh, in data collection, uh, and lots of times you'll have to do that. And then there's also this question of to what extent is uh, your application special to you versus generic to everybody else? And you can see Google and other companies now are offering these uh, pre-trained models to do speech recognition or image recognition or text processing and so on that are trained over sort of everything in the world. And one approach is use that and if it works, you're done. Another is to say use that and if it doesn't quite work, modify it by adding in some of your data and the other approach is saying, uh, no, my application is so different from, from what that was that using it doesn't help at all, and I gotta st start from scratch with my own data. And uh, there's no one answer to that question. You, you've gotta uh, do the investigation yourself to see what the right path is. Um, so on the interpretability piece, what do you think about machine learning as it relates to the advance of human knowledge? As in, in the retina example, the, the doctors have the results as if their model of the eye improved, mm -hmm. but it didn't in fact. Right? They don't actually have that, that knowledge. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, so that's a good question, right? So. Um, Let's see, so this, this gives you hints, and, the, and I think there's lots of ways that uh, we do experiments, we get some data, we don't quite understand it, and then you have to go back and create new theory. And I think it's always like that, and there's this leapfrogging of uh, experimentation and, and theory. Uh, and maybe what's different now is machine learning gives you a much more powerful tool to do the experimentation. So maybe in the past, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of clever humans around, and theory may have led experimentation more often than not. Uh, but lot, you know, lots of discoveries have always been made by somebody saying, "Huh, that's funny," rather than saying, "I have a theory." Uh, saying, you know, here's some unexpected results. Now, can I go explain that? Uh, and then the uh, so machine learning will help trigger that curiousness. Can it help do the explanation itself? I, I think that's an area where we need a lot of improvement, right? And so I showed like some of these charts where you could uh, uh, look at your space of data and decision boundaries and so on, and that gives you some idea, but we need a lot better tools to, to have a better conversation uh, uh, with the machine learning algorithm to understand what it's really doing. And, and then I think the other issue is people get confused sometimes with this issue of understandability 
and they blame the algorithm when they should be blaming the problem, right? Uh, and so things that are understandable are things that can be described in simple terms, right? So if I want to uh, balance a checkbook, uh, I know how to describe what the right answer is and I know how to write a program to do that. And maybe it's complicated to get it exactly right, uh, but inherently that's a simple problem and so the code to solve it should be understandable, regardless of what programming language you write it in or, or what system you use to write it. Whereas, you know, recognizing somebody's face, that's just an inherently hard problem. Uh, hard in, in the sense that there's often no definitively correct answer. Here's a face, who does that belong to? Uh, you know, experts can disagree <coughs> on what the right answer is. There is no one right answer. And then secondly, because the process for, un for discovering it is unconscious. Right? There is no expert that can uh, tell you, this is how I made that decision. Rather, it's, uh, I don't know how I, d I did it. My subconscious mind did it rather than my conscious mind. And so people blame the machine learning algorithm for not solving those two problems when it's not the algorithm's fault. It's the fact that the problem was difficult to begin with. Hi, I have a very basic question. Uh, how to identify uh, a machine learning problem? There are certain obvious problems in, in which is core to my business, but there are multiple places where we can apply the machine learning. So I'm still figuring out how to find out a, a real use case for machine learning. Yeah, uh, I think that comes down to experience, right? So I, so I mentioned the case where, uh, you know, our product managers on, on the photos team uh, hadn't identified the problem, right? They didn't know that that was a possibility that they could try. Uh, so you've got to be kind of up to date on uh, what some similar problems that people have worked on. That's why I wanted to show you today a, a, a wide range of possibilities just to sort of get you thinking about he here's the types of things that can be done. Uh, so you need to, to get that spark of an idea, hey, here's something somebody else did, this seems similar to what I'm doing, and then you need to be able to analyze that to say, what do I need in order to have success there? Well, I need the right kind of data, I need the right kind of uh, objective function, I need that to hook up to the users and be useful to them. So uh, figuring out those steps of what could define a, a product, and the, the more often you do it, the better you get at it. How often is it viable to actually reduce the model down to something that runs usefully on a mobile phone versus being too complex and needing to go off to the cloud to compete? Yeah, uh, so we're definitely spending a lot more time doing that. Um, and uh, fortunately, many models are much easier to run than they are to train, right? So uh, the training process is complex, uh, but then uh, if you can get it onto the phone, uh, I think there's a there's you know, a wide variety of, of things that are covered pretty well, right? Phone, phones are really, really powerful now, uh, as long as they don't have to be on all the time, right? If, uh, as long we, as it's short bursts. Of yeah, we, we haven't yet got to the point where you can be running your video on your phone all day long and, and analyzing all the scenes in front of you. Now your battery dies long before that. Uh, but we're, you know, we're working in that direction. Uh, so I think you should say, by default, the answer is going to be yes, I can make that work. And then the question is, how do I make it work? Right? So uh, what's the process of compiling the model and making it small enough, making it uh, not too power hungry? Uh, how often do I have to update the model uh, and recompute it in the cloud and then download it? What do I download? Uh, what are the uh, privacy concerns of, you know, so one advantage of having a model that runs on the phone is that you can be Im immune from the liability of holding somebody's private data, right? So if it's only on their phone, then it's their problem and not your problem. And you can't be sued, you can't have that data recovered and so on. 
Uh, but the disadvantage then is you aren't, uh, if you aren't collecting the data, you aren't taking advantage of uh, possibility for improvements. And so there is a lot of research now on ways in which uh, you can share parameters for your network without uh, revealing any of the secrets of the data underneath. And I think those are the real issues of, of what's the architecture of what runs where and when does it get updated and how does the data flow. But you should probably assume that if I can solve those problems, I can get it to run on the phone. Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs>